بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حياكم الله يا أيها الأحباب continue on in our study of Bulugh Maram the comprehensive book the warning against evil conduct we reached hadith 1279 narrated ibn umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a zulm or oppression will turn into darkness on the day of resurrection mutafaqun alayhi so this is the hadith of ibn umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu or radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma in which he said qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-zulm zulumat yawm al-qiyamah mutafaqun alayhi al-zulm zulumat yawm al-qiyamah so he said that uh, oppression will turn into darkness on the day of resurrection the day of judgment or yawm al-qiyamah as is familiar with us and we're also going to read the next hadith because the next hadith is uh, another narration of the same, uh, uh, around the same topic and its relevance to this bab is, again, these are those manners that the Prophet wasallam warned against. And as we mentioned uh, prior to this, that some of the uh, other ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we studied were ahadith which affirm the manners in which we want to possess. So these are those uh, those manners masawi uh, al-akhlaq the manners which are uh, known as evil conduct or evil manners, manners that you want to be far away from. So in the next hadith 1280 narrated Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said beware of oppression for oppression will turn into darkness on the day of judgment on the day of resurrection and beware of niggardliness for niggardliness destroyed those who were before you uh, and this was in Muslim. So these ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I think it's, it's uh, understood the relevance with this chapter. And the relevance is, is that these hadith are from, uh, are mentioning manners that we should avoid. They are hadith. And that's why the, the uh, Imam ibn Hajr al Askanani, rahmatullahi alayhi, rahmatin wasiyah, why he entitled the chapter, Bab tarheeb min masawil akhlaq. He said the chapter of warning against evil conduct. And so these group of hadith and these manners, man, uh, mannerisms and traits and characteristics are traits that are mithmum, meaning sinful, and traits that we want to avoid. And so this is putting the fear in us, and it's a warning to stay away from these traits because these traits uh, are often mentioned along with punishment, the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal. So in these two ahadith, we see uh, immense benefit that can be abstract, uh, abstracted from these uh, hadith. And from the important points that we need to uh, observe and gain from this hadith or these two hadith is that first and foremost the place of oppression and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the ghalimi he hates those who oppress and this is why it is mashroor it is legislated as we know from another hadith uh, that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned 
that the dua, the supplication of the one who's oppressed, is one of those accepted supplications. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates this trait, and he aids those who are oppressed against the oppressors when they supplicate. And this goes for Muslim and non-Muslim. So it shows how serious oppression is that even the non-Muslim, if you are oppressing them, you're taking their rights. They can supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though they commit shirk. And that dua can be accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. So, and the Prophet وسلم, said in this regard, فإن, uh, And so the Prophet وسلم, said, Fear the, uh, you know, beware the supplication of the oppressed, for verily between it, meaning the supplication, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no hijab. So there's nothing stopping it. It's something that is accepted. And what we see when it comes to oppression, ahabatifillah, oppression can occur in three ways. And one of the ways there can be oppression with regards to someone's mal, and oppression with regards to nafs, and oppression regards to ird. Uh, meaning, oppression regarding one's wealth, oppression regarding oneself, and oppression regarding one's honor. That those are three ways that a person can be oppressed. So. Uh, oppression is not simply just a physical act of oppression or for example a lot of times people associate oppression with certain rights that the government doesn't give them or the government taking some of their rights they look to this as a form of oppression and perhaps it can be a form of oppression but in as general categories we look and find that oppression is in uh, those three ways either through one's wealth meaning their wealth and their property uh one's self and one's honor and we know this as an islamic concept from the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he said in the dima'akum wa amwalakum wa أَعْرَاضَكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ حَرَامْ كَحُرْمَ يَوْمَكُمْ هَذَا The Prophet ﷺ said, He said, Verily, your blood and your wealth and your honor are forbidden forbidden uh, to one another. Meaning this is the, the, the status of the mu'mineen, of the believers. That is not permissible for you to violate the rights of your Muslim brother. You shouldn't violate anyone's rights, but these are sacred rights. And, uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said that they are haram to you. Absolutely prohibited. Similar to the sacredness of this day as he was mentioned in this uh, during Hajj. And this shows us, or from this hadith, we see that these three ways of oppression are mentioned in this hadith, or these three rights are mentioned in this hadith, and what is understood from that is that by violating those rights, of course, that is oppression. So these are three ways in which you can oppress. And that is oppressing through wealth, through, you know, usurping one's wealth, someone's wealth, or their honor, or their blood, or their selves, you know, their lives. And some examples of ways in which a person can fall into oppression or ways that people can be oppressed. For example, when it comes to 
For example, wealth. That if you violate the rights of someone, for example, the person who uh, is an employer and they refuse to pay their employee after they have done work for them, then this person is now taking the right of that employee. They are violating their right of wealth. Or any time, or even taking the wealth of someone unlawfully, that this is taking their right. This is uh, violating their right to their wealth. Uh, uh, an example of the way in which oppression can be regarding the nefs or oneself, uh, this can happen in one of two ways. One, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in this hadith, he said, in the dama'akum, he said, verily your blood. So by violating and spilling the blood of someone unlawfully, that this is a type of oppression of them. You're oppressing them. And perhaps this is an oppression of their family and their loved ones who have now lost this person or you've harmed them. That this is, uh, this is a type of violation of their, of, of obviously their blood their lives. But this oppression also can include, and this is Vulma Nefs, when you oppress yourself. And so how is it, we ask, can you oppress yourself? You can oppress yourself, Ahabat by committing, for example, zina or adultery and homosexuality and other sinful practices which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. So when a person does this, there's a couple of different things that can also happen on how this can follow under oppression. So for example, if the person is single and has not, they're, they're single and they then commit uh, uh, fornication, then now they have oppressed themselves. This is an oppression of oneself. And that is because they have now violated the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they cannot harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that violation but they've only harmed themselves. So they have harmed themselves. So when you do that or when an individual falls into fornication, for example, and they get perhaps a little satisfaction. For a lot of people, it's a matter of a minute. Some people, maybe it's a matter of an hour. Whatever the case may be, it's very temporary because when, after they have finished their act, their sinful act that they've gained a major sin from, they're going to want more at another occasion. They're, it's not going to be su not suffice them to remember that act and, and, and then prohibit themselves, but they're still going to crave it because they're going to crave that temporary satisfaction of following their hawa, of following their desires. And all they have done, they have not harmed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the least. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. But they've harmed themselves. They have oppressed themselves. Because now they incur major sins, which warrant making toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a situation where this can also spread to others is if the person is, which is even greater sin, if they're married and they commit this sin. If they are married and then they commit adultery, then now they have violated the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which harms them, it doesn't harm Allah, and they've uh, violated the right of their spouse. You know, they have oppressed them, because if the spouse were to know of this wicked sin that they have committed, they would feel harmed. They would be harmed. They would be hurt by this. And this is a violation of their haq, of their right. Wallahu musta'an. And the third type of oppression, of dhulm fil ard this is the oppression of the honor of someone else. 
And for some examples is when you backbite or you slander someone that you've now slandered their honor. You've tainted their honor. This is why it's so serious, the harms of the tongue, is it, because they're so easy to fall into. As the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when he was going by uh, two graves, and he mentioned about some knowledge of the unseen that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had imparted upon him. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, he said, verily they're being punished and they're being punished for something that the people don't consider to be great. He said, as for one of them is they didn't properly clean themselves. You know, when they use the restroom. And as for the other is they used to commit to backbite and spread tales around the community with the intent of spreading wickedness. So for example, if you hear something and you haven't affirmed, you say, oh, I heard so-and-so did this. And then now you spread that around the community. Hey, guess what? I heard so-and-so said this. What? You heard so-and-so said this? They spread it. They spread it. You've now, you spread it you didn't spread it with even the, for one, the way you violated, you didn't affirm that. Number two, you spread it. So when you spread things like this, you're spreading it with an evil intent. Even if you think, even if it was just entertainment, that's still an evil intent. That's not something which is acceptable. You didn't spread it because you were, there was a need for someone else to know about this sin, this alleged sin or this alleged, this allegation which can be false, but you spread that wickedness around the community. So what have you done now? Now the person who has done this, they have violated the right or the honor of the person they've spoken about. And so this is why it's very serious uh, to be cautious of the tongue. And there's so many ahadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which illustrate this point and, and ahadith that we've already mentioned about uh, prior to this. So that is the way, that is a type of oppression, vulm al-a'rad, or vulm fil ir And this is the oppression of, of one's honor. And all of these types of oppression, they warrant uh, a punishment. And part of that punishment As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith, he said, أَظُلْمُ ظُلَمَاتِ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ That uh, oppression is darkness on the Day of Judgment. Meaning that that oppression in which you violated others' rights will be a, will come and haunt you on the Day of ju Judgment. You'll, be, you'll have, be responsible and held accountable and that will be darkness for you on Yom al Qiyamah when the believers, the Mu'minin, will have nur. They will have light. But the disbelievers will have darkness. And the hypocrites will also have light and then it will disappear. So this is some of the punishment for such a wicked for falling into oppression. In the hadith of Jabir, he mentioned, and this was the, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, he mentioned, he said, and fear. Or, or beware of niggardliness. You know, beware of being miserly and stingy and beware of wanting and envious of other people of what they possess and wanting those this ni'am to be taken away from them as we mentioned prior to this about the harms of envy. So what we learn from this hadith or these hadith, this hadith aim, of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
And uh, a further point I want to mention is that the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the last statement in that last hadith in Sahih Muslim, he said, "فَإِنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ مِنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "For verily it destroyed those people who came before you." So here the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam let us know that this has that these same sins, these same sins. They destroyed those who came before us. Wallahu musta'an. May Allah protect us from uh, our own sins and from oppression. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. What we benefit from this hadith, or these two hadith, is first, these hadith are a stern warning against oppression in its various, various forms. As we mentioned, oppression in wealth, oppression in uh, nafs, you know, the, the, the could be oppression oppressing yourself or it could be oppressing someone else by violating their, their right to live, harming them. Or the oppression in regards to one's honor. So this is a stern warning against, the, against all the oppression and that oppression is from the major sins and that we also understand that there is an, uh, 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 a wa'id a punishment, the threat of punishment is there for such a serious sin as the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that oppression, that it will be a darkness on the day of judgment. So we know that that is something which is punishable. Another benefit of this hadith is that that part of the reward or punishment of uh, that this hadith it affirms this principle that anna jaza'a min jins al amal that sometimes that sometimes the reward for something is in relation to its uh, relation to the the action which merited that reward so this can be in a negative way and it can be in a positive way so if you do something righteous and part of and it's mentioned in the Shar in the Kitabilla or Sunnah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that that action which is a good deed merits something similar in the day of judgment, then that's an illustration of this kind of this principle. This is an illustration of this principle in the negative form, in that by oppressing in this life, you will is a type of oppression in the hereafter that your reward for oppression is oppression. And that's what it means, Jazab and Jins al Amal, that the reward is part of the, or the punishment is part of the crime, so to speak, or is, a, or is in relation to the crime or is a part of the crime. So oppression equals oppression, meaning oppression in this life equals oppression in the hereafter, or oppression in this life means darkness in the hereafter, in this case. And so that is. Uh, in an illustration of anna jaza'a min jins al amal uh, also in this hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we learn the uh, this uh, affirms for us that there is such thing as yawm al as a day of judgment and this is what the mu'minin believe in and that yawm al qiyamah it entails three primary uh, issues or stages that people or the fact that it's named Yom al Qiyamah. And that is when we're using the term Yom al Qiyamah, the day of resurrection. And if you wanted to literally translate the word Qiyam, Qiyam is from what? When you Qiyam for Salat, you stand up. So the relation from a linguistic point of view, or perhaps why it's referred to as Yom al Qiyamah, the day of of resurrection or the day of standing this is a uh, just a linguistic uh, uh, terminology is that first people will stand or be resurrected from their graves on the day of judgment that's number one so then it is the yom it's the day of resurrection what kind of resurrection the people be resurrected from their graves as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
ليوم العظيم يوم يقوم الناس لرب العالمين uh, for a a a mighty day or the you know the, the a, a great day the day in which people will be raised in front of their Lord. The second reason for this name is that people that witnesses will stand on this day for witnessing what people did in the dunya. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, Inna lanansuru rasulana walladhina amanu fil hayat al-dunya wa yawmu ashhad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi Kitab al-Kareem, Verily we shall assist uh, our messengers and those who believe in the uh, those who believe in the in the life of this world, this worldly life, and and Yomo Kiyama, you know, there will be witnesses. Or that there will be witnesses in the uh to to what they did in the in this life on the day of resurrection. The third reason for this name, Yomo Kiyama, is on this day is a day in which Yukum that justice will be carried out. So, or yaqam fihi al adl, that uh, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will, you know, justice will be dispensed on this day, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "We kitab al kareem وَنَدَعُوا الْمُوَازِينَ الْقِسْتَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا تُظْلَمُوا نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem in Surah Al-Anbiya verse 47 that we shall put the scales of justice on the day of judgment. يوم القيامة The day when they'll stand. They'll stand for justice. They'll stand for, they'll be resurrected. And no soul will be oppressed at all. So in this day, no soul will be oppressed. Another benefit of this hadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or these two ahadith is it shows us the obligation to fear oppression, to avoid oppression, to be far away from oppression. And that's a reminder for myself and my brothers and sisters is that we have to do our best to be just with people. Give them their rights, no matter who they are. And we know the Qa'id, as we mentioned many times, that the asl fil amr al-wujub, that the, the, the origin or the, the origin of a command is that it's an obligation. It's obligatory to follow. And especially if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, gave us the reason why as well. Then that that's uh, a very strong warning that that's that action that he gave the reasons related to it, or the punishment attached to it, and, and and what have you. That it shows us how even more serious that affair is, and that it's an obligation to follow. And that lets us know that oppression is from the major sins. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith lets us know that taqwa is not only, as we mentioned, taqwa Allah that taqwa strictly for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that that is uh, also taqwa from the, the punishment, or taqwa is also used as a term to avoid uh, certain sins and to fear certain things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمَ تَرْجِعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى Allah and fear the day in which you will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is commanding us to have taqwa, to fear it, to be weary of the day, 
day of Yom Kayama, uh, the day where you're going to return to uh, to your Lord Subhanahu wa Taala, wa inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Likewise, there are many ahadith and many uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what taqul nara lati uiddat lil kafirin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and fear the fire which has been prepared for the disbelievers. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has uh, uh, ordered us, commanded us to fear the fire. That the fire is so serious you need to fear it. And that means fearing those things which lead to the fire. They're being away from them. And so many uh, the source to illustrate, uh, you know, from Ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. Uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, fear the supplication of the oppressor, of the one who's oppressed. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, fear the shubahat or beware of doubtful issues. Uh, so there are many things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have ordered us uh, to have uh, taqwa from, you know, to fear and beware of. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows us that uh, the, the impermissibility, of course, of having, of being uh, miserly and stingy, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our many shortcomings, and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us that taqwa shuha, fear. Uh, miserliness or, or niggardliness. You know, fear it. Beware of that that wicked trait. And a last benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that one of the reasons uh, that that also this ummah is restricted from what the prior ummahs also were restricted from. That there are those things which was a reason for their destruction which would be a reason for our destruction if we followed their sunnah. And there are so many ahadith which illustrate this point, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ مِنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ For verily it destroyed those who came before you. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ is warning his ummah, because we, if we follow that, then we will be destroyed as they were. And there are so many ahadith uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Let uh, tibiuna sunan min kana kablakum that you will follow the way of those who came before you." And that was also a warning, but also a prophecy to let us know we would follow uh, the Jews and the Christians and other nations who had fell into error and deviance, and we would follow their ways, even so much as if even if they fought, went in the hole of a lizard, we'd follow them. So we'd follow them in shirk, we'd follow them in bid'ah, we'd follow them in all kind of things which are impermissible uh, in Islam. And those are some of the main benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith, hadith uh, 1281, narrated Mahmud ibn Labid, Rahim, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The thing I fear most for you is the lesser shirk, the showing off of good deeds. Uh, Ahmed reported it with a Hassan, good chain of narrators. This hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <clears throat> is one of those ahadith which illustrate for us the importance of avoiding shirk at all cost. And, and its various forms. And that we learn from this hadith as well as other uh, narrations that uh, shirk uh, is divided into categories. Shirk can be the major shirk and shirk can be the minor shirk. And then the ulama have also made further uh, divisions as far as the intricate details of shirk. And for our information and for the purpose of studying this hadith, uh, knowing that shirk al-akbar and shirk al-askar, shirk al-akbar is in reference to, tho to those uh, acts or uh, aqidah or creed of polytheism or statements that take one out of the fold of Islam. That is shirk 
al-Akbar, Shirk al-Asgar, which is inclusive of this Riyadh that is in that is being referred to in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is <coughs> Shirk al-Asgar refers to those the minor Shirk, and all Shirk is uh, is sinful and from the major sins. All Shirk is from the major sins. But all shirk does not take you out of the fold of Islam. So I hope that's clear. There's major shirk, which takes you out of the fold of Islam, and the minor shirk, which does not take you out of the fold of Islam, which is a wasila, and we'll talk about that more, uh, which is a means to the major shirk. We'll talk about that more as we get into the explanation of this hadith of the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And When we talk about a riyah, a riyah is referring, it's a reference to uh, showing off. And that means when we show off, generally that is something reserved for the eye of what people can see. Uh, and when a person does an act of worship or something, so that the people will praise him, the people around him, he's showing off in front of them. This has to do with them seeing him uh, perfecting his ibadah or his looks or whatever the case may be. This is the type of showing off which is referred to in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a riya. So a ra'i, yara, this is... Uh, this has to do with seeing as an Arabic verb. Ra'a fulan. I saw, uh, he saw so and so. He saw so and so. So, this verb, ra'a, is a verb in the past tense form of, uh, and, and it's a, 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 in English you would say the simple past. And it is referencing the action of seeing. And so a riya is coming from this verb. So it lets us know that this is a, uh, a reference to shirk, which has to do with showing off, which has to do with seeing. Meaning that people, someone is beautifying their acts so that others will praise him through sight. They see him and they do it. So the man, for example, comes into the masjid. And he's going to pray to Allah Azza wa Jal, but then uh, from his uh, his own nafs or from the shaitan, he's whispered to to say, hey, the people are, are kind of checking you out. Let, show them that new thobe you have. Or show them how perfect you raise your hands in takbir. Raise it all the way to your ears perfectly so that the people can kind of, you know, they know that you're from Ahl Sunnah or that they know that you're a person of ibadah and worship. So... The shaitan will come and whisper to you, and this person is doing begins to change their, their worship and alter their worship in order to please the sight of the people. Uh, and then there's also what is referred to, and I forgot the Arabic term, but it's when a person shows off, which is also could be from the minor shirk, like Riyah, but this is so that the people will hear about you in order to be famous for example so the person he does lectures and so forth so that the people will recall his name they want to he wants to be heard so it doesn't mean he's necessarily seen it's a little different than riyah although the concept is the same as a it can be a type of shirk and it can nullify the action which it is taking place in so that person if they're doing lectures so that the people would hear of them then that can negate that act of ibadah, which they could have been, which could have been something that brought them closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, and may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protect us from that. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika and ushrika bika wa ana a'lamu wa sa'afruka lima la a'lamu. And this hadith has many fawaid. And from those uh, fawa'id or benefits is this hadith 
shows us the gentleness and concern of the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for his ummah. And he salawatu rabbi wa salamu alayhi, he said, akhwafa ma akhafu alaykum. He said, the thing which I most fear for you. And this shows that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feared for our misguidance, feared for our punishment, wanted good for his ummah. That he loved his ummah, even though he never met us and we never met him. And even though we never saw, he never saw us and we never saw him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this shows us that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam was concerned for his ummah. Those people who entered into his ummah. He wanted paradise for them. He wanted guidance. He was sent as a rahmah lil alameen. He was sent as a mercy for mankind. And a guidance and a source of guidance. And we have to follow him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and benefit from his, his concern. And the guidance that he offered us through his sunnah. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows us the that sin and shirk, which is one of the major sins, and uh, that they have different levels. They have different levels, and that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Inna akhafu ma akhafu." Verily, verily, uh he said, Inna akhwafa ma akhafu. He said, Verily, the greatest thing in which I fear for you. Meaning that he feared other things for us as well. He was fearful we'd we'd love uh the dunya and we'd worship the dunya. He feared that we would we would love wealth. He feared that we would uh be destroyed from our excessive love of women. He feared so many things that goes in accordance with our desires. He felt he feared that our desires would destroy us and, and many other things. But he this is one of the things he feared more so. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which shows us that there are different levels of sin and there are different levels of things to fear and there are different levels of ma'asi and dhanub and shirk. Another benefit of this hadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is it shows us, as we mentioned, that shirk divides into the major shirk and the minor shirk. And one of the criterion for knowing something is uh, from the major shirk. The major shirk takes you out of the fold of Islam, uh, and as a, uh, as far as a ruling, and it's. It is those actions or beliefs or statements which violate Tawheed in totality. So the one who goes and supplicates to the dead, for example, or the one who uh, they sacrifice to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they make sujood to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they totally prostrate in front of someone or something, a statue. These violate Tawheed in totality. So, uh, or seeking help from the dead. That these are from the major shirk. As for the minor shirk, those are those actions and beliefs and statements which are a means to the major shirk. Or else they're mentioned uh, specifically as from being from the minor shirk. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned a riya. A riya is in its asl, it is from the minor shirk. But a riya can also get to the extent because a riya itself is showing off, meaning someone could show off so much it could go to the major shirk. For example, if someone enters the masjid with the total intent only to show off so that the people see them then this can actually perhaps fall into the major shirk, even though it's riya. So it's very important that when we classify these classifications, that we understand that they have gradations as well. 
that if a person does something solely khalis and act ibadah for the people, not even for Allah at all, then this can be a total violation. It can violate their tawheed. It can actually make them out of the fold of Islam. So this is why it's very careful That, you know, that we have to be very careful with regards to any and all forms of violations of Tawheed and so forth. So the minor shirk is a wasila. It's a means uh, to the major shirk. And some of the forms of uh, minor shirk would be, for example, the one who wears the tamaim, like an amulet. And they do this uh, because this can be a violation or it can be a means to the violation of, of uh, believing in that amulet and that that amulet possessing some lordship or uh, that it can remove harm and bring about benefit. So this is why it's a very dangerous and serious thing because it can affect your intiqad, your uh, aqidah, and it can violate your Islam. It can actually turn into something uh, major. So it's a wasila. It's asl is that it's a means to the uh, major shirk. It's it's minor shirk, but it's a means. So that's what defines it as a minor shirk instead of the major shirk. But that means that it could then in turn turn into the major shirk, and that's why it's uh, prohibited and must be avoided at all cost and sinful. Wallahu musta'an. And another point that is wor uh, worthy of mentioning is what is also known, we also hear a shirk al-khafi. And this is in reference and how this relates to a riya, a shirk al khafi, or the difference between it and a riya, is a shirk al khafi, who al ladi yakun fil qalb. So, this hidden shirk, which has a relationship with a riya, is the shirk that when you it's hidden in your heart it is minor in that it is uh it's minor but but no one can can see it unlike the tama, the tamima that we mentioned the amulet which would be vahir it is something which is open but it's also for minor shirk so a shirk al khafi is that which the people cannot uh, see. And that's one of the uh, references to, to that form of shirk. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also is a stern warning against riya, and that riya is uh, muharram, it's impermissible, it's a major sin, and that uh, we must avoid it at all costs. And then another mas'ala comes up. Another issue arises because some of the ulama of the past, they classified, they said that, uh, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we can have in kareem, Inna Allah la yaghfuru an yushrika bi wa yaghfuru ma duna thalika lima yasha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al Kareem, Verily Allah does not forgive that you commit shirk, you know, and, but he forgives other than that for whomsoever he pleases. And so the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal says he doesn't forgive shirk, how we understand this ayat is that meaning the person who, who dies upon shirk. So not that a person falls into shirk in its one of its various forms and then they're not forgiven, halas. No, but rather that they fell into shirk and they died upon shirk. And so a group of the ulama understood this to mean all shirk, the minor and the major. And another group, and this is the sawab, this is the correct view, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, 
is that this is in reference to the uh, major shirk, that the major shirk, if you die upon the major shirk, making sujud to uh, idols and, and uh, you know, worshipping Jesus, alayhi salatu salam, or worshipping Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or worshipping the angels, or whatever the case may be, a major act of shirk that this, uh, and die upon that, that takes a person out of the fold of Islam and from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the one who dies upon the minor shirk, we say that they are under the Mashiatillah. They are at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, huwa yu'adhibuhum, or inshallah, huwa yaghfirluhum. If Allah wills, He will punish them, and if Allah wills, He will forgive them. So they're tactile Mashiach. They're at the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. And those are the main benefits of that hadith. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself in the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم until our next sitting السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته